there we go. We should be on. There we go. Yeah. Wonderful. Good morning. It's good morning. really good to see you all again. Um, we're carrying on with our series that we started last week, which was entitled We Do Life Together. Um, if anyone missed part one of We Do Life Together, basically what we're doing is we're taking a look at the, the Sermon on the Mount, so from Matthew 5 through to chapter 7, and looking through those and looking at four key principles that Jesus pulls out that's teaching us how to do life together as a church, that we're not just called to do Sunday services together, but we're called to actually live life together with one another, in fellowship with one another, learning and growing from each other. And so the first key principle that we found out last week was that to do life together, the first thing we have to do is we have to be dedicated to the cause that we're living. So we looked at how when we, when we bring a new child into church, we can do a dedication service. And part of that dedication service is where we say that we will commit ourselves to bringing the child up in the way that they should be. And as a church, we should do exactly the same when we see new people come into the church and the people that are sat around us, that we are dedicated to helping them live the life that God has called Amen. them to live. That it's not about what we can do for ourselves, but it's about what we can do for the people around us and how we can help them in the walk and the calling that God has gotten placed on their life and that when we dedicate our lives to serving the people around us that that's when church moves from unity into oneness we looked at how unity is a task based thing that it's coming together for the purpose of accomplishing something but when we move into oneness it's coming together with a soul spirit that our spirits align and say this is what we are trying to do together and this is the heart that we have behind it it moves beyond just the purpose and the task into the heart behind why we do something and if we're going to see the church grow and expand as they they did in the book of acts in the early church the only way we can really experience that is to move beyond unifying together move beyond just task-based things just things that we do in the church and put on we have to move beyond that and say this is the spirit and the heart behind why we do church that it's about making a life that we live together so Today we're going to take the second part of our, our study about the We Do Life Together. And the message of my title, the, the title of my message this morning, is that we are called to be candlesticks, not fires. Hopefully that will start to make sense as we go through this. But what I want to do is, if you've got your Bibles with you, if you turn to Matthew chapter 5 with me, and we're going to, we're going to start in chapter 5, but we're going to bounce around a little bit between those three chapters. But I don't know about you, but if you've ever done cooking... There's been times where I've cooked something and it looks really nice, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it looks really nice. But then as I taste it, I realise that I forgot one small ingredient that makes a massive difference to the flavour, and that's the salt. I tend to forget this in either rice or peas. For some reason, whenever I cook these things, I seem to forget to put the salt in them. It just slips my mind. And what I find is when I taste them, it just doesn't taste the same. There's other times where I think, that's probably not quite enough salt. And I chuck a little bit more in. And it does not taste the same either then. It tastes very strong in the mouth and it's not pleasant to eat. But I found that if you get the salt just right, it enhances the flavour of the food that you're eating. And that's exactly the same in life. That When we read in this passage, we're going to start reading from verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus starts to talk about how we are the salt of the earth. That we add flavour to the things that are around us. We add flavour to the people that are around us. But we have to get it right in the way that we do it. If we don't do enough, it lacks any flavour. But if we do too much, we can quite easily overpower and consume the people around us not because we're doing anything wrong but because we're doing it in the wrong way or with the wrong approach to how we're doing it so let's take a look at verse 13 and it says this it says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its flavor how shall it be seasoned it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men i want to focus on this verse just for a moment When he talks about we are the salt of the earth, this is the purpose that we are put in place for. It's talking about we have a purpose to be the salt to the earth and and to bring flavour to the earth, to make a difference to what's around us, to make a difference in the situation that we're placed in. It's our purpose, it's it's our calling, it's what God has placed on the inside of each and every single one of us to do and to be and the things that he's called us to step into is to be the flavour of the world around us but what happens is so often we get bogged down with the things around us we get overweighed by the situations that are around us and we begin to lose our flavor it says if the salt loses its flavor it's good for nothing but to be thrown onto the ground and trampled underfoot 
what happens is that sometimes when we hit situations that feel like they start to trample us underfoot, there's a choice in how we can respond to this. We can either lose our sense of purpose and lose our sense of calling in what God's called us to do. Then we begin to lose our flavour and we are just trampled and wasted into the ground. But there's an alternative. When we get trampled over by situations, when we get pushed down by situations around us, if we choose to stay focused on the purpose of what we're called to do, the things that we're called to be, then something different happens. There is a passage back in Judges in the Bible where it talks about that they fought for the land and then they sowed the land with salt. Now what this meant is that when they conquered the ground, they sowed the salt and said that this land is now being conquered by us. We have the victory over it and this is a symbol of the victory that we have. When we read this verse in Matthew 5 verse 13, what I think we can take from this is that if we get trampled down by the situations that we face, if we get overpowered by the things that are around us, we can either choose to lose our purpose and lose a sense of what we're called to and we lose our flavour. Or when we get trampled, we can keep a hold of the purpose and it says that it's trampled into the ground, but then that ground becomes sown with the salt of the purpose of our life and we become the victors over the situation that we're in because we're a symbol of even though I get trampled down, even though there's situations that I face that are hard, I have overcome those situations because of the purpose that God has placed on my life. We become a victor in that and it's a symbol of saying I might be pressed into the ground, but I will sow the purpose of my life into the ground that I'm pressed in, into the situation that I find myself in. I will grow from that. I will grow out of that situation. And I will be a symbol of victory over that situation. Yes. But it's a choice that we make. And the only way we can make that choice is if we know what our purpose is, if we know what our calling is. And so often, it's really easy to lose sight of the purpose and the calling that we have in the busyness of life that surrounds us, in the things that just come our way, the situations that arise. We can be so focused on doing life that we forget why we're even doing life in the first place. And that's such an awful place to be in that we lose yes. our sharpness, we lose our cutting edge uh -huh. because we're so focused on doing the thing that we feel we're supposed to be doing that we get tired, we get worn out, we lose that... that, that that spirit of what we can do and the purpose that we're called to be. And I think what Jesus then does is he begins to unravel this thing and say, you have a choice when situations face you. You can either operate in the purpose that you're called to or you can be trampled underfoot and thrown to the wayside. But this is how you know the purpose that you're called to. This is exactly what Jesus moves on to in verse 14. He says this, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Yeah. Jesus instantly moves from saying, you have to choose whether you operate in your purpose to say, this is what your purpose is. You are the light of the world. Jesus yeah. doesn't say you are called to be the light of the world. He says you are the light of the world. This is something that you have been created to do. So often people get so focused on how they can be an example to the world, what it takes to be a light to the world, that they forget that actually you already are that light to the world. It's something that's built into your DNA of who you are, the person that you're called to be, that if we learn to operate in who God has made us, that we naturally become a light to the world. If we understand who Christ is in us and the calling that he's placed on the inside of us, that if we operate to our strengths, operate to the way that we were made, that we become a light to the people around us, that we're not called to, to change to be a, a well-shaped light or a Barbie-shaped light or a Stuart-shaped light. You're called to be, for me, it's a Michael-shaped light. For Joy, it's a Joy-shaped light. It's a Val-shaped light. Whoever you are, there's a purpose and a uniqueness that God made you in that you are called to operate in and be a light in that way. But I like what Jesus goes on to say. He says that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all that are in the house. I found this bit really interesting where it says that they don't put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. We're called to be a candle on a lampstand. I want you to imagine like a candelabra for a minute, that kind of thing where you, you've got sort of the lampstand part and then the candle in the top. This is what we're called to be, is the candles that light the room around us. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the film Beauty and the Beast or sort of know the story of it, but as, as, as Belle, the, the princess in the story, goes into the, the castle where the beast is, she picks up 
a candelabra and starts to work around the castle trying to find if there's anyone in there. And it lights up the room around her. But something kind of happens as she picks up this light, this lampstand, that as she's going around, all of a sudden, the lampstand talks to her and it absolutely freaks her out. I don't know about you, I would get really freaked out yeah. if the lampstand started talking to me or any inanimate object started talking to me. I would think, wow, I must have eaten something very strange before I came out or something like that. It, it would make me very concerned about what was going on. And I think Belle had exactly the same reaction, that she got very concerned about the fact that a lampstand would start talking to her. But one of the interesting things is that when we do life the way that quite often some people do, that we think we're called to be a light to the world, that means using our mouth, that means being the spokesperson for the world, that we are called to be God's mouthpiece in the world. And there's an element to that where that's true. But this isn't what Jesus says here. What he says is that you don't put it under a basket, but you put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You know, the purpose of light in the house is that it illuminates the things that are around. It shows off all the wonderful things, and it shows up all the dirt as well. If you turn off the lights in here... Now, please take this the right way. I'm not dissing the cleaners who've been in. But if you turned off the lights in here and left the room for a few weeks, dust begins to gather... But you can't see it because the lights are off. You could walk through the room and have no idea what was around. But as soon as the lights switched on, you then begin to see not only the wonderful people that are in here, but you begin to see some of the dust and dirt that comes in as well. That's exactly the same in our walk with God, is that when we become the light for the world around us, that we illuminate the wonderful things in people. But we also begin to illuminate some of the rubbish that people have got as well. Right. Every single person has rubbish and things that hold onto them, that cling to them. <laughs> Bits of dust. If I stand here long enough, I will gather dust. It's just a natural thing that happens. I'm not going to, because that would be worse than watching paint dry, in my opinion. Just standing, gathering dust. It's like, it's like watching paint dry, and then the next step is just standing, gathering dust. It's even worse than watching paint dry. But we're not called to be the mouthpiece where we go around and you know you could imagine that if I came in here and started shining a light on the dust and going oh Bob you that there's a bit of dust there and a bit of dirt here and oh joy you you really you really need to change that you you could do with cleaning up did you have a wash this week I could I could be really cruel and start going around (laughs) there are only certain people I would say that to (laughs) but I could be really cruel and go around and say oh have you seen this that, that the little bit on you, that, that bit of dust, that bit of dirt, you, you really should do something about that. Have you seen that? Do you, can you not see it? Am I the only one? Who, all of a sudden we think, how can nobody else see the problems that this person has? We think, we think it's our job to be the mouthpiece for the, for the dust and the dirt that's around us, on the things that are around us. But what Jesus says in here is that it's put on a lampstand to be a light for all that are in the house. Let me ask you, in your house, who is responsible for tidying up or cleaning up? It's it's the owner of the house, ultimately. You don't invite a guest around and say, could you just come and clean my house for me, please? Then you can sit on the sofa and watch telly with me. But please, would you clean the house first? That's that's not the way most people tend to operate. That might it might be a really good idea. We could we could come up with a new way of cleaning houses that we have church cleaning parties come and visit my house I'll cook you dinner but the hoover first and the vacuum and the duster and we could do I, I've, su- <laughs> I've suddenly undermined the whole purpose of my message by coming up with a new way in which we can clean but generally it's not the way that we clean house generally it's the owner of the house that is responsible for keeping it clean and tidy And that is exactly the same in the church. There is not the responsibility of the people in it, the visitors and the guests who come in, or the people who spend time here. But it is the owner of the house. And if this is God's house, it's God's job to clean up the people that are in it. So often we become the mouthpiece and say, it's my responsibility to point out everything that's wrong with you. It's my responsibility to change you. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says we're here to be a light. That when our good works shine around people, that we don't have to be the talking candelabra that shouts out and says, look at all the problems you've got. But we say, these are the good works that God is doing through me. And it begins to shine a light on the things around us, the people around us. And God begins to do the work on the people and change the people around us. That God comes in and says, you know what, it's time to do a bit of cleaning. But it's in God's time. We can't rush people and say, this is what you need to do to get to the place you're supposed to be. We're here just to say, this is what God is doing through me. This is the example 
than my life is to the people around me. And then in doing the good things that God has called me to do, in doing the purpose that God has called me to do, that I am a light to the people around me. And the more light we have in here, the clearer we can see the dirt, and then the better God can deal with it. That God doesn't need us to turn around and say, God, by the way, have you seen the dirt on Joy's face? By the way, have you seen the problem that so-and-so is in? Have you seen the issue that this person is going through? God sees it all anyway. But what God says is that there's a time and a place for him to deal with the situation that people face. It's not our responsibility to say, you need to change, but it's our responsibility to say, this is how God is working through me. This is the life that God has called me to live. Let it be an example to the people around me. If we can skip ahead to chapter 6 and then down to verse 22 of chapter 6 and it says this. It says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? As we said, we're called to be a light, an example to people around us. But we can control how good a light we are. We have a built-in dimmer switch on us, and it's our eyes. Our eyes are the built-in dimmer switches of our lives, if you like. That might be a really weird sort of mental picture, and you might start picturing everyone with dimmer switches on their eyes. Please don't go around trying to turn people's dimmer switches up or down. That's not what I'm trying to say, but what I'm saying is that we have control over the way in which we light up the room around us, that we light up the situations around us. And it's through our eyes, it's through the things that we're allowed to come in, the things that we see, the things that we do, that, we, that become part of who we are. You know, we, we can have control over situations that come around us, and then there's some situations that we have absolutely no control over at all. But those things that we can choose to see, those things that we can choose to enter into, those things that we can choose whether we partake in or don't, those are the things that will begin to change your dimmer switch in one direction or the other. If you choose to fill your mind, fill, look at all sorts of things that are full of rubbish, that, that drop your spirit level, that sort of keep you pressed down and don't build you up, it begins to turn that dimmer switch down. Every time you watch something that just really makes you feel naff, but you just watch it anyway it begins to turn that dimmer switch down. But every time you change what you watch, you turn something on that glorifies God, that builds up your spirit man inside of you. When you start reading the word and and realising that it's part of what God made us to be, was to, to read the word that he's given us so that we grow, it begins to turn that dimmer switch back up, that we become brighter than more things that we're allowed to enter through our eyes. But it's, it's a choice that we have as to whether we let it come in or whether it goes out. And we have that choice of whether we turn it up or turn it down, all based on the things that we do, the things that we allow ourselves to be partakers in, the things that we allow ourselves to get into, the situations that we enter into willingly. They all make a difference to how brightly we shine. And of course there are situations that we enter into that we have absolutely no control over. I think those are the times where God gives us sunglasses to get through it. And the only kind of sunglasses that I think God gives us is his word. His word acts as sunglasses. It becomes a filter for the way that we see things around us. That when we learn more of what God's word says, that it becomes like a pair of sunglasses, that we still see what's going on, but the harmful rays are killed off. That sunglasses block the UV rays that could damage our eyes and allow us still to see the picture. It might not be seen in exactly the same way. It's seen in a different light, but it's healthier for us. Quite often we enter into, we were talking last week about how if we're going to be dedicated to the cause of what God's called us to, that we have to leave behind situations that have been holding us back. Quite often people see those situations for what they are and they want to see it that way. I think quite often God calls us to see it through his sunglasses, through his word, which changes the way that we see that situation. The situation becomes visible in a different kind of light, that it changes the, the dynamic in which we see it. And it becomes much safer for us that when we look at those situations, it doesn't harm us. But because we're using God's word as the filter for the way that we see things, that actually we can see it in a new light, in the way that God sees it. And then we can find the best way forward. I don't know if you've been driving and and all of a sudden the sun just seems to drop below the, the sun visor. And if your window screen's a little bit dirty, all of a sudden you cannot see anything. It just glares 
And that's kind of what the world does sometimes, I think, is that it throws situations that, are, that just blind us, that we cannot see what's in front of us. We cannot see the direction. I was driving up when, um, when I went up to the Roaches the other week. I was driving up there, and I went round one bend. And because the sun was quite low, all of a sudden I could not see anything. And I'm driving around a little country road that's one car wide. And I'm thinking, what on earth am I going to do? I literally cannot see a car coming the other way. If it, if it ran straight into me, I wouldn't see it. And that's where a pair of sunglasses would have been really helpful in that situation. I would have been able to stick them on and see much clearly, much more clearly because it lowers the intensity of the problem around us. And that's exactly what the word does. That when we look at the situations that we're in through what God's word says about us, what God's word says about the situations that we're in, that it lowers the intensity of those situations so that we can then find a way to walk through it, that we can then find a way to cope with those situations. It, it moves from unbearable to actually I can see a way forward. That's the power that the world has over us, is that it creates a glare that's so unbearable that we have to either look away or stop. God's called us not to stop or look away, but to keep moving in the purpose that he's called us to. But the only way in which we can do that is to have his word as a filter for our eyes so that we can see the situations for what they truly are and not for the unbearable glare that the world tries to create. But as I said, we're not called to be the voice for people. We're not called to point out the things that go on around us. But we're called to be a light for those situations. If you flick with me quickly over to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3 and verse 5, it says this. It says, Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With God we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. I said the title of this message that we were called to be candlesticks and not fires. Candlesticks illuminate the room around them for, for God to work on the people around them. Fires are when people start to use their tongue, when they start to say, you know what, you need to change this, you need to do this, this is what is wrong with you, these are the situations that you face. And we begin to point out, like Lumiere in, that, in the Beauty and the Beast, we begin to use our words and, it, and we think it helps. We think we're pointing out things to help people. But actually what we're doing is we're, that we're setting fire to them. That's exactly what James says, is that our tongue becomes a fire, set on fire by hell itself. I think it, it talks in James about confusion, that where confusion reigns, that all manner of things seem to happen. And, and that's sometimes what our tongue does, is that we get confused about the way in which we use it. That we use it thinking that we're doing something good. Yeah. And instead what we do is we set on fire the people around us and begin to discourage them and tear them down with every word that we say that seems like we're helping them, but actually is using our mouth rather than our actions to prove the way in which God is faithful to us. If our actions show God's love through us, we don't need to use our tongue. Uh, Sir Francis of Assisi was misquoted by saying that preach the word, use... Oh, no... Oh, I've got it. Preach the gospel, use words if you need to. It wasn't quite what he said, but I still like the, the quote anyway. Preach the word, preach the gospel, use words if you need to, or if necessary. It's this idea of the gospel is not what we say, but it's how we act. It's the lifestyle that we live. It's the actions that we put forward that show the people around us what it truly means to live life together as a church, to live life together in the calling that God has placed on us. And this is what James says in verse 13. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. When we use our actions rather than our words, 
that's the wisdom that God has placed on each one of us, that we begin to operate in a wisdom that goes beyond what we could think. And we begin to show the world around us what God truly means Amen. to us. What God truly means to the people around us and what God truly means to every individual. We said last week that when we looked at the Beatitudes that it was how God stopped and said to each individual person, whatever situation you're in right now, there's a path forward. If you're struggling with depression, there's a path forward. If you're struggling with this situation, there is a path forward. Amen. The first thing we have to do is we have to, be, we have to say we are dedicated to showing people what it means to live life the way God calls us, that we're dedicated to show people that we're here to help them, not to tear them down. But the second thing we have to do, once we've been dedicated to it, is we have to demonstrate it. Our actions have to come into line with the dedication that we make, with the words that we say. Our actions have to line up with that. And if, above all else, our actions should be much more important than the very words that we speak, like Sir Francis of Assisi said, that we preach the gospel and we use words when necessary. That if we can learn to be a light through the actions that we, we show, the actions that we do, the things that we, we, we present ourselves as to people around us, and also the things that we allow ourselves to take on board. If we're aware of those dimmer switches that we have, the choice that we can make whether we improve our vision or lower our vision, the choice that we can make to put on the sunglasses of the word that help us to filter the situations around us, that when our actions come into line with that, that then we can truly understand what it means to live life together, that it's not about correcting people around us, but it's about showing the love of God to the people around us. Amen. It's not about coming along and saying, you need to change this, but it's about saying, this is what God's love has done for me. If I can be the prime example of how God worked through me, I don't need to stand here and say, this is what God is going to do for you, because my example should be enough for the people around me. And if it's not, then the only person that I need to change is me. Amen. Because if my example does not shine back to God and say, this is what God has done in my life, then I'm the person that's in the wrong, not the people around me. If people aren't seeing God working through the actions that I do each day, then I'm the person that needs to change. My actions need to change so that I line up with what God has called me to do. So here's my challenge to you this morning. Think about our actions that we make. Think about the things that we do. Do they light the path for people around us? Do they illuminate God through the things that we do? Or do you find that your mouth tends to do much more of the work than your actions? Very good. I think very often in church, and we're not going to point at people and say, you're the person, but very often in church, the mouth is the first thing that we use before we use our eyes to light the situation around us. We're not called to be a mouthpiece in the church. We're called to be a light in the church so that God can work on his people. Amen. We create an environment that is comfortable for people to come into, that is safe for people to come into, so that then God can do his work. The difference between a dark room and a light room is that if you walk into a dark room, you have no idea what you're stepping into. If people walk into a church and all they hear is the words that are being spoken, the criticisms that are coming at them, they don't feel safe. If you walk into a room and the light is on, you feel a sense of safety Absolutely. because you can see Amen. what's around you. As a church, we should be open, bright, we should be obvious, we should be able to say this is what we are and people should be able to see everything. That includes the rubbish but it doesn't mean that we stand there and point out the rubbish, it means that we say God is dealing with that, it's his responsibility not mine. We don't invite guests into our house and say clean our house for us although apparently it seems like a good idea. We don't do that, we say this is my responsibility, your responsibility is to come in and enjoy the hospitality yes. that I have. As a church, that is what we're called to do. As Christians, that is what we're called to do, to live a life that says, come on in and enjoy the hospitality that Christ has for you. Awesome. And then let God begin to tidy Amen. up. So as we said, the first key principle to living life together is dedication. The second key principle is demonstration. How do we demonstrate Christ to the people around us? So let me close in prayer. And, do it, and then I'll hand back over to her. Father God, I pray that you would show us how we're called to be a light to the world. That you would show each individual in this room the uniqueness that makes them the individual that only they can fill the calling that you've placed on their life. 
But Father God, I pray that if they're feeling downtrodden, that they would not lose a sense of purpose, but they would understand that it is your calling that is placed on their life, that we are called to make disciples of every nation, that we are called to be a light to the church and to the people around us so that they could see the things that you do through us, Father God. That our light would not point back to ourselves, but it would point solely to you yes lord so father i pray for every person in this room that we will begin to create a church where people can come in and feel safe where people can come in and feel comfortable but where people can come in and feel free to have god move in their life where they can come in and say god this is a safe place for me to be changed by you father god i pray that you would close mouths when we think we need to speak that instead we would look to actions. Oh, Father God. Father, that you would make us wise in the meekness of wisdom, that we would operate yeah. in the way that you've called us to operate, Father God. Mm. I thank you that you work on each and every single one of us and that not one individual in this room is there yet, but we're all on a path to get yeah, there. absolutely. And so, Father, I pray that we would look to the people around us and we would say, God, who is next to me that I can help on this path that we yes. call life? Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow, great word. Alan, could you pass us a basket for me, Trace? Thank you, Stu.